want to tell you that the type of Mass that we are celebrating is a daily Mass without singing, also known as a low Mass, because of no singing. The priest and server will come from behind the altar. When we come out, uh, we will reverence the altar, which is a symbol of Christ and the people of God gathered around Christ. And then the priest will bow to the altar and then kiss the altar, rep which represents Christ. Please stand. Before we actually begin the Mass, for many people, a worship aid such as our Missalette assists people in following the order of the Mass, although the priest has a number of options available to him, so you may never fully become aware of what the priest is going to do, but at least you have the basic order of the Mass, which starts on page 4 of the Missalette. The full order of the Mass is at the very beginning of the Missalette. Then for Sundays, of course, you turn to the proper date for the readings and the responsorial psalm. For daily Mass, uh, you'll find the entrance hymn, which is spoken, uh, as well as the responsorial psalm verse and the communion song towards the back of the Missalette on page 243. And we would look at uh, Thursday, March 6th. And if you would turn to 243, we will recite the entrance song, which functions at a spoken Mass as the opening hymn of a Sunday Mass would function. So together, let us say the entrance song. Let hearts rejoice who search for the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek always the face of the Lord. The Mass always begins with the Trinitarian formula and the sign of the cross. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace and peace of God our Father, the love of his Son Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always. What I have just spoken to you is the greeting of the Mass, a religious greeting that indicates that the Lord is with us and strengthens us as his parish community. This very first part of the Mass is called the introductory rite. It helps us to unify ourselves as God's people at this Mass, and it prepares our hearts and our minds and our bodies to receive the Word of God. But prior to hearing the Word of God, we must acknowledge the mercy and love of Jesus Christ. So let us pause with a moment of silence and ask God for that mercy and forgiveness. Together we say the Confidior. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have sinned through my own fault, in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. And I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. And now we have the absolution that lets us know that God's mercy does indeed redeem us. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And now we have what is called the Kyrie, which is the only uh, Greek portion of the Catholic Mass that can be said in English. But tonight we will say it in, uh, in Greek. Kyrie eleison. Kyrie eleison. Christe eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. This Greek portion of the Mass recalls that at one time the Church of the East and the Church of the West were fully united. The Church of the East used primarily the Greek language for the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. During the season of Lent, uh, the Gloria is not said or sung. And normally, at a daily Mass, the glory is not said or sung unless it is a feast or a solemnity. And so we have now what is called the opening collect, 
which brings together the entire first part of the Mass and prepares us to listen to God's Word. Let us pray. We pause with a moment of silence to reflect upon the goodness of God and the sacrifice of Jesus. Merciful Father, may the penance of our Lenten observance make us your obedient people. May the love within us be seen in what we do and lead us to the joy of Easter. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. With the praying of the collect, uh, the first part of the Mass, the introductory rite, is completed. And now we enter what is called the liturgy of the Eucharist, or service of the Eucharist, where a lector, a lay person, comes from the congregation to proclaim uh, either the Old Testament and the New Testament in the responsorial psalm. At a daily Mass, there is only one first reading and a psalm. There's not a second epistle reading, but we go directly into the Gospel. And during the liturgy of uh, the Word, it is God now speaking to us uh, and asking us to hear His Word so that we might be strengthened in faith and allow the words of God to change our hearts and to change our lives, to change our behavior. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it, to it, and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I see how stiff-necked this people is. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt? with such great power and with so strong a hand. Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent he brought them out, that he might kill them in the mountains and exterminate them from the face of the earth? Let your blazing wrath die down. Relent in punishing your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. Our fathers made a calf in Horeb and adored a molten image. They exchanged their glory for the image of a grass-eating bullock. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. They forgot the God who had saved them who had done great deeds in Egypt, wondrous deeds in the land of Ham, terrible things at the Red Sea. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. Then he spoke of exterminating them, but Moses, his chosen one, withstood him in the breach to turn back his destructive wrath. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people.
many parishes, there is silence normally after the first reading for us to reflect upon its meaning and what the Lord is trying to say to us collectively as a congregation, but also individually. And then the psalm response is meant to incorporate us into giving thanks to God for uh, the gift of his word and the ways in which he has acted within salvation history, both in the Old Testament and New Testament and to this very day. Then after the responsorial psalm, uh, we stand for the gospel acclamation. During the season of Lent, the Alleluia is not sung. There's a separate uh, uh, um, acclamation uh, that does not incorporate the Alleluia. And I will uh, speak it uh, once I get over to the pulpit to proclaim the gospel. We stand for the gospel because the gospel contains the very words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is out of respect for the words of Christ contained in the gospel uh, that we show reverence uh, for the gospel by standing. Prior to the priest proclaiming the gospel, uh, he bows before the altar and asks uh, God's blessings to prepare him to proclaim the gospel. Normally this is done silently, but I will do it aloud uh, this evening so you can hear what the priest is praying pri uh, privately. Please stand. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips that I may worthily proclaim his gospel. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that everyone who believes in him might have eternal life. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is either proclaimed by a priest or a deacon, and there is always the religious greeting uh, prior to the proclamation of the gospel. The Lord be with you. Then the priest makes the sign of the cross on the book of the gospel, and then with his thumb and the congregation would join him, uh, they would make uh, the sign of the cross with their thumb on their head, forehead, uh, lips and heart. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. May the Lord be in my mind, on my lips, and in my heart. Jesus said to the Jews, If I testify on my own behalf, my, uh, my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries to John, and he testified to the truth. I do not accept human testimony, but I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you were content to rejoice in his light. But I have testimony greater than John's. The works that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform testify on my behalf, that the Father has sent me. Moreover, the Father who sent me has testified on my behalf, but you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, and you do not have his word remaining in you, because you do not believe in the one whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life through them. Even they testify on my behalf. But you do not want to come to me to have life. I do not accept human praise. Moreover, I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I came, into the name, I came in the name of the Father, but you do not accept me. Yet if another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept praise from one another and do not seek the praise that comes from, from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before my Father. The one who will accuse you is Moses, in whom you have placed your hope. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And the priest kisses the book of the Gospel, saying, May the Gospel of the Lord wash away my sins. Please be seated.
And now we have what is called the homily or sermon, but homily specifically refers to preaching on the giving, given set of readings that we have just heard. The Old Testament reading in this case from uh, the book of Exodus, the psalm is from Psalm 106, and of course the gospel tonight is from St. John. And the scripture readings always offer us a variety of expressions of God's love for us. Uh, and also his challenge. And there's also an element of judgment, as was indicated in tonight's gospel reading. Jesus is dealing with people who simply do not accept him as the Messiah, as the Son of God, as the one sent by God. And because of this, he tries to indicate to them that he is a part of salvation history, that Moses himself uh, proclaimed Jesus as the one who would come. And here Jesus is in their midst, and they fail to recognize him, and because of that, they bring judgment upon themselves. Now, there's a part of history, obviously, that we, ref we reflect upon when hearing this gospel, but we can't leave it in the past. How do these words apply to us? And in what circumstances do we fail to acknowledge the truth of Christ in our midst? and fail to respond to him wholeheartedly with our total lives by opening ourselves to change, to conversion, to repentance. And so the word spoken is not just for the people 2,000 years ago, it's for us today, not only individually, but also collectively as a parish and as a church. This word is meant to uh, sustain us and to keep us in union with Almighty God. And so the homily is meant to explain these readings uh, and to draw us into them so that when we are dismissed from here, uh, we will bring the love of Christ to the world and that we ourselves will live as Christ wants us to live, that we will turn away from anything that is foreign or alien uh, to our Judeo-Christian heritage. And so the gospel today reminds us that Jesus is still with us. The Mass is meant to be an expression of the risen Lord who is in our midst, who draws us to the Father through his sacrifice on the cross. And this sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is lovingly accepted by God the Father. So in a sense, Jesus is our High Priest who represents us to God the Father and draws us to God the Father. And we, through the ministry of the Mass, the priest acting in the person of Christ, see that uh, made quite visible. And we are here to give thanks and praise to God for calling us uh, to himself. Because if not for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, if not for his shedding of his blood, if not for the new covenant in his blood, none of us would have a hope of eternal life. We would be still mired in sin and death and excluded from God's kingdom. So what the Mass makes visible is the powerful love of God that brings us forgiveness through Christ. And Christ not only offers himself to the Father, where the Father lovingly accepts Christ and his sacrifice, but he offers us. And at Mass, the loving Father accepts us together with his son Jesus because we are now the body of Christ. Christ is the head, the groom. We are the bride, so to speak. And so the Mass is a powerful expression of what God does for us in the person of Christ and how the Father in heaven accepts us through his son. And so the priest at Mass represents uh, Jesus in a visible way to show us that uh, Christ is our representative before God the Father. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are drawn into the very life of God. We also say that the Mass is uh, the unbloody sacrifice of Christ. We don't re-sacrifice Christ, but at every Mass we enter into the mystery of the one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice is continually offered to the Father through Christ. And the Father continually accepts that sacrifice on our behalf. And so as we continue the Mass, let us give thanks to God that he has drawn us into eternity at this Mass and that 
the entire body of Christ is present, not just those that we see, but those that are invisible to us. All the saints, all the angels are with us because uh, all of us together are the body of Christ, both those of us here on earth and those in heaven. And Jesus, who is the sacrificial lamb that God accepts lovingly, also becomes our food, our sustenance on this, our earthly pilgrimage to eternity. At a daily Mass, the creed is normally omitted unless it is the Mass is a feast or a solemnity. Tonight, uh, what we would like to do is to hand on the Apostles' Creed to those uh, of our elect who ha are not baptized. So what, we, what I'd like to do at this moment is to invite our non-baptized elect to come forward and just simply stand in front of the altar. Your sponsors do not need to come with you. What we will be giving you tonight is the Apostles' Creed, which is a bit shorter than the Nicene Creed that we normally profess at Mass. My dear friends, listen carefully to the words of that faith by which you will be justified. The words are few, but the mysteries they contain are great. Receive them with a sincere heart and be faithful to them. I'd invite the congregation to please stand. I will say the first sentence of the Apostles' Creed alone, and then, in terms of giving it to you all, I will say the next line, or two lines, and then I would ask the congregation, but not the unbaptized, to repeat that after me. And then once they have said it, I would ask the non-baptized to repeat uh, after me, after the congregation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. And is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Catholic Church. The communion of saints. The forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Let us pray for these elect who will be brought into the church at the Easter Vigil, that God in his mercy may make them responsive to his love, so that through the waters of rebirth they may receive pardon for their sins and have life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us pause with a moment of silence. Lord, eternal source of light, justice, and truth, Take under your tender care your servants, these elect. Purify them and make them holy. Give them true knowledge, sure hope, and sound understanding. And make them worthy to receive the grace of baptism. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now during Mass, we have what is called the General Intercessions, also known as the Prayers of the Faithful, where we pray... Uh, for the church, the world, the sick, uh, and other needs in the church. And these are uh, uh, intercessions, as, as you well know. And so let us now offer these intercessions to God our Father. Let us pray for Pope Benedict and all the bishops of the church that they may teach, rule, and sanctify us according to the mind of Christ and his holy church. We pray to the Lord. Let us pray for our president, all world leaders, and all people that they may respect human life from conception until natural death and thus promote peace, justice, and reconciliation in the world. We pray to the Lord. Let us pray for all who suffer in mind, body, or spirit, that they may be comforted and strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the care, support, and love of their church. We pray to the Lord. Let us pray for vocations to the priesthood and religious life that our young may hear and answer God's call to serve the church. We pray to the Lord. Let us pray for all who have died, the faithful departed, in particular uh, for Curtis Brown, our custodial uh, person here in the parish who died yesterday. That eternal rest may be granted unto them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for our elect and our candidates who will be received into the church at the Easter Vigil. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And in the silence of our hearts, let us add our own particular intentions. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Good and gracious God, you've called us to be your church, baptized in your Son Jesus and gifted with the Holy Spirit. Hear our grateful prayers and renew us in faith, hope, and love. Grant this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. So we have completed now the liturgy of the Eucharist. If this were Sunday, we would now have the preparation of the altar, which we will do, uh, but also the collection of monetary gifts. Then once the collection is completed, the gifts of bread, wine, and money is brought to the altar as a symbol of our offering uh, that we are giving to God. Ordinary bread and wine will become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ as we enter into his one sacrifice on the cross. Sometimes incense is used. Incense reminds us, first of all, of our prayer rising before God as a pleasing fragrance. But incense also honors uh, ordinary gifts that will become extraordinary through uh, the power of the Holy Spirit, gifts of bread and wine uh, that will become the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Incense honors the altar, which is a symbol of Christ and the people of God gathered around him. At a daily Mass, uh, we do not use these things or have the uh, procession of gifts, yet they are placed on the altar and still represent uh, the toil of the congregation and of the church and our gifts to God the Father. Many of the prayers that I will now recite are called preparatory prayers, which are normally done silently by the priest, but I will say all of these aloud this evening so you will know what the priest is normally praying silently. And these prayers are included in uh, the Missalette, if you wish to follow along. The Missalette is uh, a worship aid that uh, helps people that are not real familiar with the Mass. Uh, When the Mass was in Latin, it was necessary to have a book that uh, translated the Latin parts into English. Um, 
but now that the Mass is primarily in English or the vernacular, uh, the worship aid is not as important as it once was. And so we, we don't encourage people to keep their face buried in a book, but to listen actively and to look. Uh, Catholic worship is very visual. Uh, and we don't keep our eyes closed and our heads bowed throughout the prayer because you would miss the action of the Mass and the beautiful uh, atmosphere in which we worship. So it is quite appropriate at Mass to pray with eyes wide open uh, and to acknowledge the presence of Christ uh, in a very visual and sensual way through our human senses of sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. The altar was prepared uh, by our acolyte with a, a, a cloth on which the bread and wine will be consecrated. This is called a corporal cloth. The book is called the Roman Missal that has all of the prayers uh, for the priest. This is called the chalice, and we have two, uh, uh, depending on the numbers of people receiving Holy Communion. All the prayers of the church are precisely that, the prayers of the church. Um, I've had Protestants say to me after they've been to Mass, Father, we would prefer to hear your prayer because it would come from your heart and we would see that you were believing. But all you did was read the prayers of the Mass. And what I had to say to them is, it's the prayer of the church that is important. My belief, my prayers are good, but not as good as the prayers of the church and the prayers that Jesus has given to the church. And so at Mass, I don't represent me. So forget about my spirituality, forget about my faith, forget about my good works, and focus on the one who is only good, Jesus Christ. Because that's where our faith relies. Not on the ministers of the church or the priest or even the congregation. We're irrelevant to a certain extent because only God is good. And if there is any goodness that is in us, it is because it is God's goodness. So the personal piety, the personal spirituality of the priest is secondary to the actions of Christ at Mass. That is made clear when the priest, in some Masses, uh, faces the same direction as the congregation. In other words, my back would be to you, and that it occurs in some Masses in the Catholic Church. But when the priest faces the congregation, as I'm doing now, sometimes we seem to forget that it's not the spirituality of the priest that we're uh, being swept into, but we're rather being swept into Jesus Christ, who offers himself to the Father, and the Father lovingly accepts him. Now, these first prayers are preparatory prayers that lead eventually to the, uh, to the consecration of the bread and wine and entering into the one sacrifice of Christ. And as I mentioned, in many Masses, these are prayed silently as the choir sings something or, or there could be just dead silence altogether. And there are, I don't have the page number, but there are responses for the congregation to these various preparation prayers. The priest then takes the bread that will be consecrated, unleavened bread, and prays this preparatory prayer. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Then the priest takes the chalice. He pours some of the wine, true wine, real wine, into the chalice. places some water in the chalice and says this prayer. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Then the priest takes the chalice and prays the preparatory prayer over uh, the chalice that will eventually become the blood of Christ. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. The priest then bows low to uh, ask the Lord to accept uh, this sacrifice. Lord God, we ask you to receive us and to be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite hearts. The priest now washes his hands, first of all, to 
uh, cleanse them prior to celebrating the Eucharist, but also symbolically to acknowledge that he needs to be cleansed of his personal sin. Lord, wash away my iniquities and cleanse me of my sin. Please stand. This preparation of the bread and wine is now complete, and now the priest asks the congregation to join him in offering the sacrifice to God our Father. Pray, brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God the Father Almighty. Now this preparation rite is concluded by the prayer over the gifts. All powerful God, look upon our weakness. May the sacrifice we offer bring us purity and strength. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we begin in the liturgy of the Eucharist what is called the Eucharistic Prayer. The first part of the Eucharistic prayer begins with the preface dialogue and the preface prayer itself, which concludes with the Holy Holy. And preface means the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. And it sums up why we are here and why Christ is offering himself to our Heavenly Father uh, for the forgiveness of our sins and for our salvation. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, all powerful and ever living God, we do well always and everywhere to give you thanks. You ask us to express our thanks by self denial. We are to master our sinfulness and conquer our pride. We are to show to those in need your goodness to ourselves. Now, with the saints and the angels, we praise you forever. And now we say the great angelic uh, song that is found in the Old Testament. We're joining the saints and the angels in offering this wonderful prayer to the holiness of God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And now that we are entering into the actual consecratory part of the Eucharistic prayer, we kneel in reverence and we kneel in prayer. There are many Eucharistic prayers that the priest can select. The first Eucharistic prayer is called the Roman Canon and it is ancient. The second Eucharistic prayer is actually older than the Roman canon and was uh, reinstituted in the Catholic Church about 40 years ago. It's the oldest but the shortest. The third Eucharistic prayer also comes from uh, the early church as well. The fourth Eucharistic prayer is a new composition that came into being uh, around 1970 with the publication of this new missal. Since that time, there have been additional Eucharistic prayers. There are three Eucharistic prayers that can be used at children's masses. There are two Eucharistic prayers that can be used uh, to emphasize uh, the reconciliation and forgiveness of God. And then there are about four other Eucharistic prayers that the priest can use that are new compositions. The priest normally will not tell you what prayer he's going to use, so it's kind of useless to try to follow it in the Missal. The Missal only contains, I believe, the first four. Tonight, though, I will be using the shorter of the Eucharistic prayers, Eucharistic Prayer 2. Again, what will occur during this Eucharistic prayer is the priest will call upon the Holy Spirit to transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ as we enter into his one sacrifice on the cross. So we're entering into eternity. But it is not the Catholic priest that consecrates the bread and wine. It is Jesus himself. Uh, and his action by the power of the Holy Spirit that changes this into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord. And there will be visible signs that will accompany the words that I will be praying 
to show forth how Christ changes these elements as he did at the Last Supper into himself. And uh, we will understand that the, the Last Supper was meant to be the memorial of Good Friday and of Jesus' one sacrifice on the cross. So we're bringing that sacrifice forward during this Eucharistic prayer. The priest extends his hands as a sign of um, his prayer to God and, and of openness to what God will accomplish uh, through the priest. Lord, you are holy, indeed the fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. The ringing of the bell signifies the importance of the Holy Spirit coming upon these gifts through the action of the priest and his hands, the laying on of hands over these gifts. Uh, and it is truly an act of God that allows this to happen. The priest simply makes visible what Christ accomplishes uh, through the priest. And now we have the actual words of institution or consecration that uh, transform the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. The congregation should look at the consecrated host, and in personal prayer and piety, we should utter the words of Doubting Thomas, St. Thomas, my Lord and my God. The priest now genuflects in adoration. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise, gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Now that the Lord has consecrated the precious blood, his precious blood, we look at the chalice and again with St. Thomas say, My Lord and my God, but we pray that silently. The priest once again genuflects in adoration. The words that I have just said over the bread and the wine is what transforms or consecrates the bread and wine and makes it the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the risen Lord. And it is at that point that the priest uh, ceases to be himself and acts in the person of Christ. So it is actually Christ consecrated the bread and wine just as Jesus Christ did so at the Last Supper. So we experienced uh, that as well, because that is now a part of eternity. So uh, you may have wished that you could be at the Last Supper 2,000 years ago. You are right now. You have just experienced what the disciples experienced 2,000 years ago at the Last Supper. And this is now a part of eternity. And so we give thanks to God uh, by a variety of acclamations after uh, the consecration. And the priest would normally uh, choose one of the four that are available, and I'm going to use the fourth one. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Savior of the world. Now the Eucharistic prayer continues and asks God in the prayer to change the congregation into the body of Christ, to unite us, to strengthen us, so that we will be faithful members of the body of Christ. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread and this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with Benedict, our Pope, Kevin, our Bishop, and all the clergy. 
Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. And now this last part of the Eucharistic prayer makes quite visible and evident that Jesus is the one who is offered to our Heavenly Father as the sacrificial lamb, and that Jesus' loving, uh, Jesus loving Father accepts him uh, for our salvation. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. And then we repeat the great Amen. Amen. Please stand. You should have noticed in the Eucharistic prayer after the consecration that we remembered, first of all, what God has done by transforming the bread and wine into his son's body and blood. We also pray that the Spirit will transform us. We pray for the church throughout the world, including the Pope and our bishop. We pray for our deceased brothers and sisters and ask God to gather them into this one sacrifice and to give them eternal life. And we also remember the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints and angels that join us in this Eucharistic prayer prior to uh, recognize that it is through Jesus uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that we give glory and praise to God our Father in heaven. Now the Eucharistic prayer is completed and we enter what is called the rite of Holy Communion and we prepare ourselves to receive the body and blood of Christ uh, by praying uh, the Lord's Prayer that Jesus himself gave us. Jesus taught us to call God our Father and so we have the courage to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And now we have what is called an embolism, which extends the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then concludes with the uh, doxology. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil, and grant us peace in our day, in your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. And now the priest speaks directly to Jesus Christ who is present uh, here on the altar under the form of bread and wine. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your Holy Spirit and your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now the peace of Christ is with us because he's here on the altar. In effect, heaven is here on earth during this Eucharist. That's very important. And in heaven, there's no war, there's no hatred, there's only peace, love, and reconciliation. And we want that to become a reality eventually at the second coming of Christ at the end of time when he judges the living and the dead and brings all those who are faithful uh, to heaven where we live with him forever. And so what I'd ask you to do is to close your eyes just for a moment and think about all those people that you are angry with Maybe those you have not forgiven. Uh, maybe those that you even hate or despise. And maybe think of those who hate and despise you and are not uh, reconciled with you. What we should be thinking and praying about during the Eucharist is that we would be reconciled and that all anger and bitterness, hatred and unforgiveness be taken away because we can't go to heaven with any of that present. We cannot come to Christ not being uh, reconciled or at least desiring reconciliation and peace. 
for to do so would be uh, the opposite of what heaven is, and therefore we would commit a sacrilege by receiving Holy Communion with an unrepentant and unreconciled heart and hatred for our brothers and sisters. So think about that and let us ask God to bring healing uh, and forgiveness and reconciliation to our lives and to the entire world. Now, when the priest invites you to exchange the sign of peace, this is not a hello and how are you, I'm glad you're here. This is an extension of that desire for peace, reconciliation, forgiveness, that we experience at Mass and ultimately in Heaven. So to symbolize that peace of Christ that transforms us and the world and sweeps us into the reconciliation of Heaven, please extend a symbol of that sign to one another. Peace be with you. Now that we have experienced the sharing of peace, the peace of Christ from this altar to the congregation, and hopefully to eternity, um, we pray the Lamb of God as the consecrated bread is broken, one loaf broken for the many. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Please kneel. The breaking of the bread is symbolic of Jesus Christ, whose body is broken for us. And many though we are, we are nourished with the one bread and the one cup that sustains us to everlasting life. And then the priest will take a part of the host that he consecrated, and he will drop a portion of that into the consecrated blood, and he will say, normally quietly to himself, May the mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. This custom that I just carried out, this uh, little ceremony, goes back to the early church in Rome. When the Pope celebrated Mass, uh, a portion of what he consecrated would be brought to every other church in Rome, and the priest, uh, when he was celebrating Mass, would take a portion of the host consecrated by the Pope and drop it into the chalice to signify that the church is unified, not only under Jesus Christ, but unified under the vicar of Christ, who is the Pope. Then after the priest has done that little ceremony of dropping a, a, a portion of the consecrated host into the precious blood, he has to prepare himself to receive Holy Communion, just as you should be preparing yourself to receive Holy Communion. And the priest has... Uh, a specific prayer to, to pray. There's two choices, and I will pick the longer of the two. Normally this is prayed silently by the priest, but I will pray it aloud tonight. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you. Then the priest genuflects in adoration, takes a portion of the host that he broke, and then he turns to the congregation and invites all to recognize Christ Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are they who are called to the banquet of the Lamb. And then together we pray the prayer of unworthiness and trust that uh, Christ will heal us. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. Then the priest uh, says quietly to himself as he receives uh, the consecrated host, May the body of Christ bring me to everlasting life.
then the same with the precious blood. May the blood of Christ bring me to everlasting life. Before I distribute communion to our Eucharistic ministers, I want to make two very important points. The most important action of the Mass was when we offered Christ during the Eucharistic prayer to our Heavenly Father, that Christ offered himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And he became, becomes the Lamb of God uh, that is sacrificed. Uh, and as I mentioned, God lovingly accepts that sacrifice on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins and for our salvation. That is essentially the most important part of the Mass, entering into that one sacrifice, because that is what brings us salvation. Secondary to that is the actual reception of Holy Communion, because as I mentioned, not only is Jesus Christ the High Priest who offers himself in sacrifice to the Father, but he is also the sacrificial lamb. And so we share in the food of Christ, his very body, blood, soul, and divinity that nourishes and strengthens us as Christians and as Catholics, unifies us as the body of Christ. For Roman Catholics to receive Holy Communion, it means several things. First of all, that we have been fully initiated into the Church of Christ, which is headed by the Pope our local bishop, our priests, that we are part of the church that has specific beliefs, teachings in the area of doctrine, dogma, and morals. So all of that is extremely important when a Catholic comes to receive Holy Communion. But it also means that we personally have faith in Jesus Christ. We believe that he is truly present here on his altar and that he nourishes and sustains us as the sacrificial lamb given up for our, sac our salvation. So it is important that we have belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we are in what we call a state of grace, that we have repented of our sins and if we've committed a mortal sin that we have first been reconciled to the church through sacramental confession or penance. So because to receive the Lord unworthily would, would uh, not bring the grace of God into our lives, but would rather be judgment upon us, would bring condemnation. Because in a sense, receiving Christ is judgment day, our personal judgment. We're in the presence of Christ, and so we want to be in a state of grace, to be found worthy uh, of the gift that is given to us. And to receive Christ unworthily would not be good for our salvation. We're also asked to fast one hour before receiving Holy Communion so that uh, we are hungry for the Lord and, and that we uh, do not allow the, the precious elements to be uh, defiled or uh, defamed in any way. We do allow lay people to help in the distribution of Holy Communion. They are normally commissioned to do so by our bishop. Now is time for Holy Communion. Uh, those of you who have not been received into the full communion of the church obviously cannot receive communion. So if you would come forward and simply cross your arms over your chest and I will give you a blessing with the Eucharist rather than the Holy Eucharist. Uh, there are two ways to receive Holy Communion for those who do receive and uh, you won't be able to receive until the Easter Vigil. But um, one is to form a, th a throne with your hands and the police, priest would place the Eucharist on your hand, and then you would place the Eucharist in your mouth, or you can receive on the tongue. Uh, either way is uh, permissible at this point in juncture in church history. If you would form two lines. May Almighty God bless you. body. 
body of Christ. Body of Christ. What remains of the consecrated Eucharist, the host, is not tossed away because it is the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, and it is placed uh, in a tabernacle, which you'll see at the Sacred Heart Altar, uh, for two reasons. Uh, First of all, because of our belief in the real presence of Christ, and then secondly, to bring uh, Holy Communion to those who cannot come to Mass, the sick, the dying, the shut in. And then thirdly, uh, the presence of Christ remains after Mass, And so every Catholic church is a wonderful place to pray because the risen Lord remains in the church, especially in the Blessed Sacrament and in the tabernacle. And the sanctuary lamp uh, indicates that the Lord is reserved in the church in that particular location here in our Sacred Heart Chapel or our Blessed Sacrament Chapel. Now the acolyte will clear the altar of of what was used for the celebration of the Eucharist. The chalice and the additional patens or plates that are used can either be cleansed during Mass in front of everybody, or as is our custom here at St. Joseph Church, they are cleansed after Mass in the sacristy, the room behind the, uh, the altar. Uh, but you will find that uh, custom varies from place to place. Some priest cleanse the chalice literally in, at the altar by using water to cleanse the chalice of the precious blood that remains and any crumbs that uh, uh, are present. As I mentioned, we must be in a state of grace to receive Holy Communion. We can't be excommunicated from the church or living a lifestyle that is alien to the teachings of the church. Uh, and if that is present, We should still come to Mass. We should never uh, absent ourselves from Sunday Mass. But we should not receive Holy Communion. But you can come up and receive a blessing, as so many of you did, if you're not able to receive Holy Communion because you're in a state of mortal sin, you haven't had a chance to go to uh, Communion, or perhaps something occurs in your life that separates you from Christ and the Church. So uh, the blessing, in lieu of receiving Holy Communion, is is certainly permissible and encouraged. Uh, Again, the reception of Holy Communion, because it is our Lord Jesus Christ, means that we must be in a state of grace, that we cannot uh, uh, be committing sin after sin and not repenting and not making a firm purpose of amendment, not being sorry for that. So to receive, again, Holy Communion in a state of unrepentant sin is a very grave and serious offense against God and could be considered a sacrilege as well. And none of us wants to die in a state of sacrilege. Uh, 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 So we should take reception of Holy Communion uh, very seriously because it means that we love God. We're in union with him. We accept him and the love that he first shows up, shows us and and gives us in, in the sacrifice of the Mass. So the reception of Holy Communion uh, is complete. Normally there's singing that's going on if it's a Sunday Mass. There may be some silence to reflect upon the Lord Jesus. And then after that moment, uh, that time of silence, then we have what is called the prayer after Holy Communion that concludes the, the communion rite of the church. So please stand. Let us pray. Lord... May the sacrament we receive cleanse us of sin and free us from guilt. For our sins bring us sorrow, but your promise of salvation brings us joy. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so the communion rite is now completed. Be seated just for a few moments. So at this point on Sunday, there's there's the mundane things like announcements and 
all the other things that we, we can do because the, the rite of communion is over, so we're kind of getting into uh, the less than sacred things. And I don't know if Before there are I any conclude the Mass with the uh, blessing and dismissal, that's precisely what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, the, the priest offers the blessings of Almighty God, and then he says, the Mass is ended, go in peace. Uh, you are dismissed. Uh, you've received Christ. You've been nourished and strengthened by him. You've been renewed in his one sacrifice. Bring Christ home to your workplace, to the world. Be evangelizers. Be followers of Christ. And so the whole purpose of the Mass is to send us forward. In fact, I would say that one of the most important parts of the Mass is the dismissal. Uh, because we are Christians by virtue of how we live our lives in the world after being sustained by Christ and his grace in the Mass. In fact, the word Mass, the English word Mass, comes from the Latin uh, words uh, for dismissed. You, you are dismissed or you are uh, commissioned. Um, in, in Latin, the, the Mass is ended is ita misa est. You are dismissed, go forth. So it's interesting to me that the name for the Eucharistic liturgy or the Lord's Supper in the Catholic Church is Mass, meaning dismissed, which means live our lives out in the world and come back as often as possible to be uh, sustained and strengthened in our Christian journey. Come back once every Sunday, obviously, or any time during the week, Mass is offered daily. Uh, and so I would encourage you to uh, appreciate the word Mass coming from the Latin dismissed, Misa. Missioned. The word mission comes from Misa. You are missioned to go forth uh, into the world. So let us stand now for this final blessing. The Lord be with you. May the blessings of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. The Mass is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, at a daily Mass, the priest normally disappears behind the altar, which I will do tonight. Uh, but after, again, reverencing the altar, uh, which is a symbol of Christ, and, and kissing it as well as a symbol of, of Christ. And we hope that all of you uh, have a safe evening and a safe uh, journey home.